science enthusiasts. Welcome to Spaces Unleashed. Every week on Twitter, we bring an expert to chat live through the Spaces program. And this is bonus content that goes with the Science Podcast. We hope we have you really enjoy the show. Uh, spaces Unleashed for everybody tonight. Um, I'm really privileged to have uh, Shar with us tonight. And uh, everybody who's been in a Spaces Unleashed before knows the ground rules. And kind of the, the uh, we have amazing guests. And I do a quick interview, about 15, 20 minutes of an interview. So you get to know who they are, um, some general questions. And then I open up the floor to questions. So you can ask our, our guests some questions as well. Now, one of the things that the, one of the rules about me allowing you to speak is um, if you have a question, make sure it's somewhat clear. Um, I check your account to make sure you're following us. I also check to see what you've been tweeting to make sure you're not a troll account or if you've, you've just created your account in the last couple days. <laughs> um, so, I, so I do check that. So that way we don't have any any uh, trolls. All right. So welcome to Spaces, Shar. How are you doing tonight? I am doing very well. And you were you're talking. You have a there's a puppy class running right next door to you. There is. I've got about twelve brand new puppies taking their first puppy lessons in class. So you might hear the adorable little squeaky puppy sounds as they begin their lesson on leave it and biting hurts. Leave it and bite it, and oh, it like the, it like don't bite because it hurts. Like don't bite it. Yeah. Yeah. Does. Does that ever get old seeing all the little puppies or is it like every time you see them, it's the, the greatest thing ever to see the little puppies? Oh, it's so special. And actually tonight, my one of my very best closest friends just brought her brand new puppy in for her lessons. And we've known each other for years. And of course, you know, sadly, our dogs don't live forever. So we've known each other's dogs throughout the years. And it was just so special to have her return. Like she could probably teach these classes, right? <laughs> and uh, just to share that moment in a very special life. Aww. So no, it never gets old. Yeah. Aww. So, uh, Shar, you can you tell everybody about the business you run? Um, you run Waggles. Can you tell everybody what Waggles is? Yes. Waggles Academy for Dogs is a training facility for the fam so we don't do things like confirmation or show ring style training our style of training is so that your dog can be a family member and go places with you uh, do things with you and have really good manners and we build upon those manners so that your dog if you want to do more things oh man we can keep you busy around here so we have different levels of what we call training. And then we have different sports and different uh, activities we can get you busy with as well. <laughs> There's lots to choose from. I was on your website and everything from puppy classes to Rallyo, um, which we'll probably have to get Beaker into because she likes, that's like agility training, right? Yeah, the difference between agility training and Rallyo is... Agility is equipment that the dog has to run through, around, over, uh, or navigate on a course. So it's actually equipment and a, and a sport, a really uh, high-energy sport. rally -O, if I can liken it to chess, where the dog has to use more brain power, and it really polishes and excels their uh, heel etiquette or leash manners. And uh, if you looked at a course of Rallyo, you would see um, several signs posted. And when you and your dog approach the sign, you perform that task on the sign. Then you move on to the next sign. And the goal is in the sport that whoever can complete the circuit with the least amount of errors in the fastest time, and it gets all the points. But we love Rallyo because you can cheer your dog on and you can give uh food reward, praise reward, play reward on the court where you're not really supposed to give food on an agility course. <laughs> That's cool. Well, thanks for explaining because I always had that question. Um, I see somebody's asked a request to speak. Uh, we'll be doing that after the little mini interview section. 
um, of the of the start here. So yeah, we'll we'll give people the ability to speak and ask questions of Shar. Um, so Shar, you're you've been dog training for a while. Uh, could you walk everybody through what got you into dog training in the first time first place like what what work that because that's really i mean everybody has different walks and jobs in life um how, how did yours get started well i was 14 years old when i trained somebody else like at arm's length for the first time but uh jason it was like i didn't even realize i was being a dog trainer um, I was always, you know, oh, I know this girl that can help you out or, or I know this girl who's really good with dogs who can train your dog or walk your dog or do this and that with your dog. And it was just a uh, natural thing for me to be able to take a puppy or an adolescent dog and get them to hold a sit or hold it down or um, learn how to walk nicely at my side or you know, wait until I've opened the gate, just different little things, you know, that you, that you would like to have as a, a household pet. Mm -hmm. And then, um, I guess, you know, um, because I've always trained my own dogs, I've trained many of my friends and family's dog. There was a time in my married life with children that we needed to make some changes in careers. And, um, I was going for a walk with my adult daughter and I said, I just, I just dream of having dogs and people in front of me and showing the people how to live and with their pet dog and how to make it just a, a real nice, comfortable, easy thing to do. And my daughter just, she actually put the mummy safety arm across my chest. <laughs> and she said, just do it. <laughs> so then the conversation quickly changed. But how? How do I give up my current career as a real estate appraiser and just jump into dog training? And uh, so we put a little bit of a plan together of what that might look like. And we started in the my garage. We had to move out the cars. And we made <laughs> my garage my very first studio for training. Oh, wow. That's cool. Was that a scary transition? Like, uh, I'm, man, I can't imagine transitioning from being a teacher to anything else. Um, so, well, yeah, because that's that's what you know, right? That's yeah. your career. That's what you went to school for. That's what all the letters behind your name stand for. <laughs> and at first, um, because I really wasn't sure how my community was going to receive my business plan, I scaled back my. Uh, my real job, I called it at the time, to part time. And I also started dog walking. I had a dog walking business. And after my real job, I'd be slipping on my sneakers at red lights and throwing my hair up in a ponytail and getting ready to stop at my first client's house to go and walk their dogs. Well, then the dog walking started to get so busy. And I was <laughs> the only. Uh, lady in or person in our city that was a professional dog walker like you could hire me I, I was like a single-handed uh, rover if we're allowed to use other company names right uh, you know back in 1998 and then I started coming across doggy clients who were unruly Jason <laughs> Well, Beaker's, a said, Beaker's been a little unruly um, since that's why she's back at Waggles so <laughs> Yeah, she's doing a mulligan. She's doing a redo. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So uh, you know, I just started asking those. You know, would you mind if I spent a little bit extra time with your dog to train them some good leash manners, or train them to not uh, chew and grab at everything on the ground during sure. our walk? And I mean, who would say no to that? And and so the training actually started one on one. And then I, the, the clientele started growing so much where it was a bit of a time management uh, goal where I come across the same student, doggy student, who needed the same lesson. Mm. So then I would ask these clients, you know, if I could get both of you in the same place at the same time, could we do like a little lesson so I can walk your dogs, you know, <laughs> more easily next time? So, yeah, then the little group classes started from there 
Cool. And now it's, it's, uh, it's grown. I, I know COVID was tough, probably really tough for you. You had to do a bunch of stuff online. Um, can you talk about that a little bit, how you had to like pivot during COVID? So we went from a little garage space or using other people's uh, places and spaces for uh, little group classes. And, you know, a, a garage could fit maybe three or four dogs in their handlers. And then uh, we were busting at the seams there, Jason. So then we started renting other places, such as the Central Middle School Music Room, which you might be familiar with. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was just so funny us pulling up in our vehicles and then the dogs getting out in the evening to go into the kids' school. <laughs> <laughs> I bet you that any kids that were there probably thought it looked cool, though. Oh, it sure did. And um, sadly, the, the room was big enough, but the floor was actually too glossy and too clean. So those poor dogs could not hold the sit baby. They were just looked like they were melting and sliding. <laughs> sliding. <laughs> We had to find another facility, but um, then uh, we were renting community halls. And I tell you what, we were cleaning more than we were training because I'd have to go into the building and sanitize and clean it for our our puppy program. Mm -hmm. And I was renting vet vet offices and I was doing a lot of traveling just to find the space. And I was just dreaming, gosh, if I could only have my space, have all my stuff there, there, have the flooring that I need, the lighting that I need, the fencing that I need. And then uh, one day there was a little acreage came up for sale and we uh, acquired that. And even before the floors were in, uh, which is about a inch and a quarter thick rubber floor that you might see in like horse stables, it's very thick, extremely heavy rubber flooring in our classroom. Mm Mm-hmm. And then our walls are made with puck board, so super easy to wash and very fun to throw rubber balls against. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then we went from just me running everything to a couple of part-timers. And now we have four trainers, two part-time uh, supervisors, dog walkers. Like it's a, it's a full operation. Oh, congratulations. We were just improved. Oh, thank you. And then, of course, like everyone else, the pandemic hits and you have to just throw on the brakes and figure out now what do we do? Mm. So we learned how to um, go on to video link, like your Zoom meetings and your Google Meet and things like that, because it's so important to be able to see the dog, right? And see the handler and see where we can help out. It, it's not the greatest. It's not the best way to train a dog handler team, but it's all we had to work with during a pandemic. And, and it worked. And you, we were talking, you had clients from uh, all over Canada um, during, for your, your uh, training, your zoom training. Yeah, I did not expect that Jason. And what was really cool is, uh, you know, our hometown here in central Alberta, there would be somebody that would sign up and say, hey, my daughter lives in Newfoundland. Wouldn't that be so cool if we could actually come to the same doggy lesson via video link? Um, So I had that going on and it was just priceless because that was almost like their visiting time as well. And they got (laughs) to see the dogs grow. Um, Yeah, it was just, it was such uh, an added gift that I never really thought about, right? never thought it would happen. I was just more concerned with how can I make this the best experience in that moment for these people. Hmm. Now, is there still demand for uh, video training or, or now that somewhat, you know, the restrictions have lifted in Alberta and we're back to face to face, you don't need to do that as much. You know, we don't, but what's kind of interesting is now that we know how to do it, it's always an option. So mm. for example, um, we're, we can now have two people per pup come into our classroom and uh, we have one team just, just tonight where um, mom and, and son to come with the puppy, son isn't feeling well, but they don't want to miss out on the lesson. So they're actually joining their class virtually. Oh. That's so cool. 
Yeah, so they still get to see the other puppies do their thing. They still get to hear and see the demonstrations, and they'll still get the lesson notes after class. Cool. I love it. Oh, and that's the other thing that uh, Waggles uh, sends is after a lesson, they send you the notes and homework. Uh, so it is. That's it, great. I love it. Yeah, because, you know, you have to practice these skills over and over and over with the dogs. Um, so, right. yeah. So, Char, just a couple other questions before we open it up to uh, our, our audience. We've got a pretty good crew here. I think there's, I don't know how many people, just about 40 people today. Um, oops. I clicked on something here. Just one second. Um, that's a problem. There we go. I'm back. Um, so we usually ask our guests about pet stories. Um, do you, do you have a current pet story you could tell us there or, uh, like a memorable story about your own dogs from your life or the dogs that you currently have? Well, Jason, can't I share that time when your dog Bunsen was in class and to hold a hold the weight or hold the still, he turned into Fred Flintstone? Yeah, yeah, that's a funny one. Go ahead. <laughs> and he would just pitter patter his front feet like he was just busting for the next cue to move forward. Like holding still was not in this puppy's vocabulary. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So when it was time to come. Bunsen would like rev up his front feet like Fred Flintstone. Um, it was, and he's a you know a little fur ball at that time because he's a burner pup. He's our little polar bear guys. Um, one of the one of the things that was also really funny is uh, you told me because Bunsen eventually figured it out and he was so good at like sitting and waiting at, like as an adult dog when he got a little older and you said large breed dogs that's their best thing to do is just to sit and do nothing <laughs> that's like the easiest thing for them yeah yeah like you know it pays really well because you know not only do we want our dogs to move when we ask them to move but equally we want them to hold still when we need them to hold still so that behavior gets reinforced pretty heavily and Bunsen caught on to that real quick this is my favorite I sit still I do nothing and they still pay me <laughs> <laughs> yeah that was his best thing I think at home before his last the level three test um we had I had him sitting and waiting for 10 minutes like he did not move a muscle um oh, nice. yeah I don't know nice. I'm just like an upper limit but that's I think what was the test three minutes five minutes three minutes yeah determine you're gonna get that three minutes so we're gonna train him to 10 <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> overachiever jason <laughs> yeah <laughs> um do you do you currently have any dogs char i currently have three dogs and they are all three at my feet right now i have boomer who is a eight-year-old wine runner i have Kaylee, who's a German Shepherd, and she turns seven in a couple of weeks. And I have Huxley, who is a, we're going to call him an Alberta special. He has a Border Collie, Husky, Kelpie, and I'm sure a touch of Coyote in him. Oh, wow. <laughs> really? How do you know he has got Coyote, or is that just because of uh, his, his behavior? Um. I, I don't. I'm, I'm sure he has a touch of coyote in him, um, partly because of his squeals and, and um, screams, but also he thinks he talks back to them out here in the country. Oh, no. Okay. <laughs> yeah. The coyotes were howling last night, I'll tell you that. Uh, Liv. Yes. Hmm. Yes. And the, the uh, I don't know, pups, kits, whatever you want to call coyote babies. They're learning their howls. So I find that so precious. But, oh, man, they were out of sync last night for hours. <laughs> I said it was like the sharp C notes rather than the comforting D notes, right? <laughs> hey, everybody. Thanks for listening to our show week after week. If you want to know how to support the Science Podcast, here are a couple ways. It's always going to be free to download. So you'll never have to worry about paying for it. But, you know, things do cost money running a podcast. And, and here are a couple ways you could help us out. One is join our Patreon page. It's amazing. It's growing. It's almost like an extended family. There's multiple tiers of support. And we have lots of fun perks for being part of our Patreon page. 
The other way you could support us is giving us an awesome review on Apple Podcasts or Google Podcasts, anywhere you can rate our podcast. Give us a great review. The third way you could support the show is checking out the BunsenBurnerBMD.com website. We have awesome merch there. We worked really hard finding quality merchandise that's comfortable with vibrant colors. And you'll find in limited quantities over the next couple months, maybe even less, the 2022 Bunsen and Beaker calendar. So three ways to support us. The Patreon page. Two, give us a great review. Three, head over to our merch stop and see if there's anything there you'd like. Thanks, everybody. Okay, we're going to open the floor to questions. So again, here's, right. a, here's how questions work. If you want to request the mic, uh, you just have to... And then we'll put about two or three people on to, ready to ask the questions. If you're shy and you don't want to speak, you can direct message me your question and then I'll read it to Char and have her answer it. Um, and we'll try to keep it on track with dog training. Um, I'm, I'm pretty confident Char could just about answer every question about dog training. Maybe not dog health, though, right? So we're, I don't think we should have any questions about dog health. Because Char, you're not a you, you have lots of knowledge about dog health, but you're not a vet. Yeah, I, you know, if anything is medical, I'll be able to just redirect it to your medical advisors. Right, right, sounds good. Okay, so the first question is from somebody who couldn't be here today, Kathy Zerker, and her question is: um, she also has a Bernice Mountain dog named Ella, and her she was wondering tips to keep Ella from jumping on visitors. Oh, the jumping up puppy. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is a great little tip, guys. Depending on how old your dog is, obviously you want to start this as young as possible to really uh, condition the response. So condition the response when a dog sees a person or approaches, let's call it your bubble. When your dog is within reach of petting, that all dogs are to sit politely and be a polite puppy before they get any type of reinforcer. So a reinforcer can be anything that makes the behavior happen again and again. So if the puppy jumps up, if the dog jumps up, if a person looks at the dog and gives them visual eye contact, that is visual attention. If the person touches the dog to say, you know, no jump or move away or uh-uh or whatever, that physical touch is now physical attention. You say any words to your dog, no jump, uh-oh, I'm going to put you on Kijiji. <laughs> if you speak any words to your dog, you're now giving verbal attention. So within about seven seconds, you can actually reinforce jumping up about five times accidentally hmm. because when you think about it if a dog is jumping up and their paws connect with you or you then you know bring your attention to the dog that's all they wanted they just want your attention so let's switch that up and your timing the handler's time to be really specific when your dog is within a body length of itself from you you're going to ask your dog to sit or a lay down because a dog who is sitting or laying down, that's the counter opposite behavior to jumping up. You want those four paws on the floor. Then the dog gets all of those reinforcers. You get to look at the dog. You can touch the face, the dog for sit. You give them all of those reinforcers that they wanted if they were to jump up. Hmm. Timing is the first tip and give and tell them what you need them to do in order to get what they want. The second tip I can offer is using a um, like a six or eight foot leash, a nice flat strap leash, like not a cord and not a not a chain leash, and definitely not a retractable leash, but just one of those regular flat strap leashes. And let your dog drag it around with the intent that you're going to do about five practices. So this is where you can call your dog and have either a toy or a piece of food in, let's say, your right hand. 
and your right hand goes down to nose level, but dead through to you. So I'm envisioning my dogs are pretty tall. So I would hold that piece of food almost right between my knees. And when their nose comes targeting towards that piece of food, they get to have it while my left hand slips under their collar or harness. So they get piece of food number one for coming. I'm holding the collar. Then I'm going to ask for a sit. And the collar hold is only to block their jumping up. Or, guys, you can stand on that leash. Mm -hmm. So if you stand on the leash and make it short enough that their paws can't leave the ground and, and connect with you, that'll allow you to turn away and not give them any... Um, any of your, your face, any visual or, or verbal attention, and you get to turn away the cold shoulder. <laughs> but you can watch them peripherally, and you can watch and feel with your feet if they offer that sit or a down. And then instantly, remember timing is important, you turn around and you praise and reinforce that alternate behavior. So tips for jumping up. Train the alternate behavior and reinforce it heavily. So when the dog is in your bubble, they're either holding a sit or a down. And then you practice that recall. So when they come running towards you, you ask for a sit. And you can use the tool of a leash or a collar hold to help you uh, block that jump. Hmm. Would you, I don't know, this is a, might be a silly question, Char. Would you transition to like having people come over to practice it with people that aren't you um or like uh at, once they don't jump up on you they, a dog might ask yes. act differently Good with question. Yes. yeah like what do you yes. think about that the other part of ella is she's jumping up on other people so ella's mom needs to tell ella what she needs to do with people that ella knows first okay and then um like within the family and then as people are coming through the door, the handler must have the dog set up for success for the first, let's say, 24 times. So when you know a guest is, Ella might be on leash, holding a sit-stay, and if she does that romper stomper, Fred Flintstone uh, dance with her front paws, that means she's over threshold, uh, Jason, and the handler needs to take Ella back a few more steps so that she's not in that excitement zone. Yeah. Cool. And then offer the, the people who are coming in like close friends and family, maybe ask them if they can hold the toy or the piece of food so that they can then practice the same drills that Ella's family were practicing with to again, show her that this lesson of no jumping up, still applies when it's different people hmm. same lesson different format and this lesson then can be taken outside of her home and her front door to outside to on the walks pet stores veterinarians you take the same lesson and now you start adding different environments hmm. i love it thanks char welcome all What's right, next? so we have Mr. Jones and then Liz on deck. So, Mr. Jones, uh, you can ask your question. Go ahead. Hi, I don't sound like a Mr. Jones, but that's actually the dog. I was going to just ask that. Is that the dog's name or the caller's yeah, name? It's, it's, <laughs> it's the dog's name. Um, anyway, it's great to hear from you guys. Um, this is going to be so helpful. And what you just said helped so much because I'm just dying over here. Um, I have a super good, um, pretty well, like home trained because he's only, well, I got him right before COVID, Australian Shepherd. So, you know, he has a ton of energy and a ton of love. Now, our issue is... Um, I'm sending him to um, obedience, like hardcore obedience training for two weeks. But I have a situation because we just moved in with someone, an elderly person that he sometimes gets along with and sometimes doesn't. There's a vibe between these two that I don't understand. Um, there was some hostility toward me in the beginning that Jones would see, and I'm not sure if he's picking up on that. 
But sometimes we're just, and he's rowdy and he's playing and he's having a good time, but then he'll just jump up out of nowhere and grab him on his arm and like tug at him and like actually break the skin because we're dealing with like a 90 year old man and this can't happen and it freaks me out and it's terrifying. But see, he's never exhibited this kind of strange behavior with anybody ever, ever, ever. So um, I guess my question is, I mean, I, I, I heard you were talking about the four on the floor, the, turn, the turning away and the distraction, all that stuff. And I, it, if this happens, like I'm five feet away and all of a sudden it will happen, if he'll listen to me. I'll just say, you know, in, my, in a gentle voice, I never have yelled at my dogs, get, you know, down or off, off, stop, off. And he'll listen to me. But we're dealing with a person who's screaming at him and swinging at him. And I'm not really sure how to how to manage this. I mean, other than like I'm sending him, he comes back from school. I guess my question is, how can I make sure that this doesn't happen in my home? Because it's it, it seems to be random and i know nothing's ever random with dogs do you have uh no. do you have some tips ship uh Char? i do um so how old is mr jones he's uh two years old jason can you repeat that uh, uh yeah he, he is two years old two okay is mr jones intact or neutered intact intact is he a breeding dog is there a reason for him being intact um i haven't decided yet if i wanted to breed him or not um i'm leaning towards not and i'm wondering if if like you are if that's an issue i mean he loves other men but he hates this guy <laughs> yeah so um i mean and it's not an aggressive there's quite a bit going on with your uh example one of the things that i think is going on whatever would arouse mr jones whether it's something that startled him something that excites him whatever it is um he's gonna get you know a real blast of of, of adrenaline right but when you have a male intact dog who is now well past adolescence that adrenaline also triggers testosterone okay in an intact dog so it takes them a little bit to recover from any of those surprises or startles or events that arouse them in you know fear or excitement so neutering isn't going to be the whole answer to this solution but it's definitely going to play a big part of it okay the other thing is um the person that is giving your dog a little bit of um, apprehension and, and grief here, this 90-year-old gentleman, has does, your, does this man have any um, form where maybe is he hunched over? Is he in a wheelchair? Does he have a cane? Does he have a walker? What else, what else does your dog see when he sees this 90-year-old? senior citizen he sees a lot of the things you're talking about that i i talked with my vet and she mentioned it's the the the, the hunched over stance the scooting on the floor the loose clothes the deep voice and the always yelling very loud like slamming things very like loud and we come from a very quiet home and we moved into a very loud home and he he's a he was a, from a litter of 12 and he was the shyest puppy. He's the most, um, not, he's not timid. He's more like reticent. Like it'll take him a moment to like you. So I think this environment is freaking him out. I agree with you. So, um, part of Mr. Jones's uh, homework is going to be what we call counter conditioning and desensitizing. And it's something that all of our puppy students um, have homework to do. And it starts right 
right when you get the puppy home and well into adulthood. So you, you have a little bit of makeup time with Mr. Jones, as well as continued exercise. And that is, let's start with um, uh, the, the hunched over um, look or the canes or the walkers and things like that. So using a broom, using a hockey stick, using all those things, let's desensitize him so that he understands that those objects are not actually an ex, uh, part of that man's body, that the wheelchair, the, the walker is not part of, it's nothing to be afraid of. It's just an object. So we can do some work on desensitizing the dog to separate the object to the person plus the form. So when a person, any person, whether a citizen or a very friendly person on the street who wants to greet your dog as soon as they bend over and reach out uh, in the dog's mind you've instantly turned into a dog catcher right a dog nap right because you're hunched over and you look like you're taking on the form of entrapment does that make sense so far it does i mean he doesn't have any implements like he's just a hunched over old man but he did do a lot of like um really quick reaching at him like over his head and you know playing at him and taunting him with toys and i'm like you can't you can't do that you can't do that but it's now i'm at the point no. where like you said i'm counter conditioning i have to t- unteach him all of this stuff that has kind of terrorized him a little bit yeah and and the gentleman is not the person to do that with yet. Right. He's going to be the dog's tech. Take each of those little elements and uh, let your dog know that it's those are things that he does not have to protect you or himself against. So it does sound a little bit about like apprehension, aggression, or even fear aggression, um, where as soon as that hunched over dog kidnapper looking person starts <laughs> raising their voice and sounding aggressive and now growling um that dog will have already given preemptors before the bite before the launch right so your dog will have either uh started licking lips or stiffened or looking away or uh eating or whale eye like what whale eyes when the dog's eyes get really big and they look away and you can see it the white of their <laughs> oh eyes God. your dog will have yeah. been given a lot of um signals and it's our job now to pick up on those signals and get your dog out of that red zone get your dog out of that sticky spot and get him doing something else yes. that will relieve him from that pressure so that's the management part of that when it does happen again pull away from that sticky spot and we want to make sure that um let, let's let me give you a quick little tip and a game to play for the yelling because you can also incorporate you know looking like um any person that doesn't walk and talk normally at your normal pace what he's not what your dog is not normally used to seeing you can throw those little visuals and audios into this game and this game guys is called the startle party oh cool and the startle party works like dog is off leash in a familiar room whether that's a garage a basement a living room and the person he knows whether that's you dad kids and you each take a turn don't all do this at the same time (laughs) and you're bouncing around and you're playing tag and you're playing catch me if you can and all of a sudden you can shout out sit and the moment your dog sits you say yes tap them on the chest and away you go again so you're kind of amping them up a little bit and you are telling him when he's in an aroused state and ready to do a play bow or spinning around or play barking you're going to tell him to sit so he's in an aroused state and then you're going to take this startle party to the startle stage which is all of a sudden out of the blue your helpers drop pots and pans or slam a book or slam a cupboard door and you tell your dog sit does that make it does it sounds it sounds perfect because that's exactly what's been going on and you know i actually told him 
when he starts doing this rowdy crap around, sorry, around him, stop screaming at him and just distract him and tell him to do something else. Tell him to sit. And and, and it actually worked yes. when he can have the patience to do it because Jones will sit and he'll be like, okay, I'm sitting. But incorporating all that noise in yeah, and sounds you know good. That sounds so good. So your job is to uh, teach the dog what he's supposed to do when situations like that arise. And then maybe um, grandpa can have some special treats. I'm holding in my hand right now, just in case my dogs decide to be alarm or, you know, door alarm dogs. I've got cod skin cubes, but I'm not going to open the bag because I know even though we're just audio i'm sure you'd be able to smell them <laughs> oh i know i have salmon so i have salmon but i'm not going to give grandpa it. a really high value dog reward treat. as soon as jones sits that treat gets tossed or thrown to him that will then do some counter conditioning and desensitizing to those unpredictable arms that keep flailing about all of a sudden grandpa's arms are throwing out Cod skin cubes <laughs> or bits of cheese. So now it's nothing to be afraid of. Oh, this is party time. <laughs> oh, that's, that's All right, is perfect. it okay if we go to another? Uh, we've got some other questions. Okay, thank you for all your time. No, it's all good. It was such, I mean, you've through this conversation, we've answered some other questions. Thank you. Um, so so there's this, there's a, oh, uh, sorry. Yeah, thank, they're just thanking you, Char. Um, Oh, Mr. So Jones welcome. at Mystery Mystery Pup Four. <laughs> the, all right, thanks for your question there. Okay, so we're going to go to some direct message questions. These ones will be kind of quick, uh, at least one of them. Sam just wanted you to repeat how old your dogs are, Shar. My dog, uh, eight-year-old Weimar. Yeah. Uh, soon to be eight-year-old German Shepherd and a ten-year-old Alberta Special. Right, the Alberta Special. Okay, another question from direct message, and then we'll go to Liz, is from Sherry. Now, Sherry, Sherry's question is about a jumping dog, so I think you could it might be already answered. But the dog jumps on her uh, daughter who's walking it when people are approaching her. So she's wondering, is the dog trying to protect her? It's a big dog. It's a golden doodle. Um are the same kind of like tricks and tips for dogs that would jump on other people be useful in this situation? Uh, so the dog is outside on leash yeah. and gets excited and it redirects its excitement by jumping on whoever's walking the dog. But maybe it's not just anyone. Maybe it's this particular person. It's this particular person. Uh, yeah. So I'm going to go with that, that we specifically said that it, that the dog only walks on her daughter or pardon me, jumps on the daughter during a walk. Yeah. So that means that team somewhere in that lineup, the jumping up on the daughter has been reinforced. So it either has turned into a game, get off, get off. It turns into a wrestling or I'm envisioning daughters walking big golden doodle, sees another dog, tightens up on the leash. That tightening of the leash then sends the dog into stop tightening the leash so i would say for this particular one watch how loose the leash is you got to keep it loose but you you can keep it short just not that there's any tension on the dog so it doesn't redirect its frustration on a t of a tight leash and do some of the tips that we t we showed before where you're going to move off of that um hot spot let's call it the spot where the dog starts jumping up move away create some more distance between uh, the incoming traffic and give the dog rewards and attention for doing an alternate behavior. All right. Thanks, Char. Um, Liz, up, and uh, we got a bunch of people requesting. Paula, you're on deck. So, Liz, you're up. Well, good evening. Um, thanks for being here today, Char. This is some really good information. Um, I was a behavior therapist, so with kids and working with kids and dogs is very similar. And I was just a couple questions. I was curious, you know, 
dogs react to us as people. And so how do you deal or how do you explain to people that consistency is key and that they need to kind of check themselves? And then I was wondering, do you ever do any training for therapy dogs? Oh, I love it. Um, I have worked with dogs with wings in the past for their service dogs. And we do have a program that will help people uh, get their dog certified as a therapy dog. I, I know, and there's going to be a lot of questions and, and things come up. I know there's lots of different ways that you can qualify your dog as a therapy dog. I just like to go through all the hoops and all the rules so that your dog is legitimately a therapy dog. Um, so not, I do not, Liz, I don't certify the therapy dogs. I help with the training so that when they find the organization that you want to certify your dog with, they do the testing and they certify. I just help with the training before that to get you ready for the test. I hope that answers the therapy dog question. Um, and the other part of your question was consistency. Um, how do you how do you explain how important consistency is to people? Consistency trains the dog because if the rules are waffly, if the rules in the house ping pong, then the dog will not understand what is expected of him or what the rules are. So he will start making up his own rules. So as an example, kids want the dog to be on the couch and on the beds. Mom and dad don't want the dog to be on the couch or the beds. So when mom and dad are gone, the kids allow the dogs up on the bed and couch. And then mom and dad come home and scold the dog or tell the dog off and Remind, remind the whole family of the rule that the dogs aren't allowed on the furniture. Well, now the dog says, well, where, where is the rule? What is the rule? I'm just <laughs> going to go on when I feel like it. And if they don't want me on, they'll get me off. So you're going to have that constant battle in your home if the rules aren't consistent. And if everybody isn't using the same verbal cues, hand signals, and family rules. How did that answer your question, Liz? Oh yeah, definitely. I was just, I was happy to hear her say that lots of families come together because I trained my dogs and then my husband came along and copied. Listen, but she listens to me and she kind of tests him because he doesn't really know what to do. And then he doesn't listen to me. But anyway, yes, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> hey Liz, maybe we should start up clicker training for husbands. You do kids, yes. I do dogs, we can do husbands together. <laughs> Opera and conditioning works on everybody. Exactly. <laughs> Liz, uh, Liz is uh, Liz has been working on her PhD right now, so she's uh, with psychology, right? Yes. Is that right, yes. Liz? Liz, yeah. can I just add another? There, it just reminded me of um, the Big Bang Theory when Sheldon was positively reinforcing Penny. I use that as an example when, when we talk about you know reinforcement, me? that you in the office. Find the uh, reinforcer that your husband's willing to work for. And every time he trains the dog or, re you know, <laughs> handles the dog correctly, mm -hmm. he gets his M&M. &M. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> I don't know. I think I work for the same treats that Bunsen would be working for bacon. So... <laughs> Food is a primary reinforcer, so. Food is a reinforcer, yeah. Thanks, Liz. Thanks. Uh, we're gonna go to Paula. Paula, you're up for your question, Hi. and then I'll give some. I'll check. People have asked questions and sent them in. We may not get to everybody today. It's really popular today, so sorry about that. Um, Paula, go ahead. Okay. Hi, Char. Nice to have you. And I'll try to be quick. Um, I have a Pooley who's a Hungarian sheepdog, the one with the dreadlocks. They say you don't own a poolie, you own a person. She um, is very strong-minded. Um, and we have a problem because um, every time I hug my husband, she starts barking and, and won't stop barking. She like I can't even 
hug him or do anything. And she just jumps up and starts barking and barking and barking and barking. We say, it's okay. Or, you know, we try to like diffuse it, but it's not working. And I don't know, this is sort of a second question too, but is a dog too old to learn a new trick? <laughs> How old is your Pooley and what's her name? Her name is Annie and she is eight. Um, so Annie is an eight-year-old Pooley. Oh gosh, guys, if there's anyone listening, if you haven't seen a Pooley, you've got to look it up. So it's spelled P-U-L-I. They are just one fascinating dog. Mm -hmm. And, uh, Paula, when I was taking, when I thought I wanted to be a dog groomer, oh boy, I was taking the part dog grooming course. And at the time where it was, I think $60 to get your dog bath brushed grew you know teeth brushed a pulley was three hundred and sixty dollars <gasps> oh my goodness because you have to <laughs> shampoo each dreadlock you cannot brush these dogs. it's fascinating well yeah this is our fourth one in the family so we had you know we've had them all along but it was my mom's dog and she you know passed away and i promised to take her but annie's been a handful so and i'm a dog too so i i know a lot of dogs but it's like you know almost like the guy that makes shoes you don't have any for your kids i can't sometimes seem to handle my own dogs <laughs> <laughs> yes and I, I i i understand that completely i feel like some days i am married to a dog untrainer um so when paula hugs her husband uh annie goes ballistic so some of that, I, I have to think that there might be a little bit of um, a couple of things going on. What we call isolation distress. So she, now she's not part of that high-end resource called touch and affection. There's maybe a little bit of possession guarding going on. Maybe one of you is her favorite person and she is not getting a piece of the pie there. And, and being left out of that um, reward. Um, or also, somehow along the way, she has gotten what she wants. So if the attention is moved away from Annie and the adults in the home are, you know, looking at one another, embracing one another, and there's the dog is right there, and she's going, hey, what about me? And somebody in that couple look at the dog dog scores another point am i on track yeah i i can understand that yeah because we try to not you know we say we, we we i i guess we try to sometimes say it's okay or then we pet or maybe that's wrong because maybe that's reinforcing it because um the same thing will happen i'll be really quick but if she if my husband works upstairs in his office if he comes down she goes ballistic but if i'm if we're one of us is only home she's she's quiet as a mouse so we don't know why she always barks, if it's excitement or if it's just what it is. But it's it's been a handful and we don't really know how to control it. So, <laughs> But I didn't know if you had any tips and I don't want to take up too much time. But, you know, I, I just like I don't well, Paula, know. Something... I'm going to give you I'll, I'll give you a quick tip. OK, Um, train your dog because you're a dog walker. You kind of have you're not an entry level here, but train your dog. Uh, train and to a mat or go to a place and heavily reward that so a dog who is laying down typically doesn't bark when they're laying down but then they stand back up so if you can really reinforce the lay down and um, whether that's you know using something to chew whether that's massage whatever that is um, so then when your husband is coming down the stairs he can say Annie go to your mat and then she's getting the alternate counter opposite behavior uh, or request for the behavior that you want to reduce. Then the same when uh, you guys are about to hug, do some trial hugs where you actually don't embrace, but you go through the motions as if you're going to hug and she's on her mat. You go and reward, give her a piece of food or a tickle or a hello while she's on the mat, go back and hug your partner go back, reward the dog, tell her stay, hug your partner, reward the stay, hug your partner. So she understands what her job is when the attention isn't all on her. And remember that, yes, you might be accidentally reinforcing that. So she only gets 
your attention, your words, your instruction, if she's doing it right. Otherwise, she's going to lose that resource. And what that means is maybe you'll go behind a door, garage door, pantry door, bedroom door, and she can't see you. She doesn't have access to you. Okay. And when she's quiet and not barking, you can reappear. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. That I'm going to try those uh, examples and those exercises. I, I really appreciate it. I'd love to hear how you do. Thank you so much. <laughs> All right. Okay. So we've got a couple people requesting the mic um, at Skeetsy Bug. So at Skeetsy Bug, go ahead. It takes a second. And then we probably have time for one more question. I think, uh, Susan, you're up. We may not get to all the direct messaging uh, messages. Um, go ahead. At Skeezy. Did I'm saying that right? Skeezy bug? <laughs> yes. Hi. Um, my name is Ellie. Uh, I've actually been a professional dog trainer for about 10 years now. And I've got a client that is just, I'm not quite sure what to do with them. Jason, I can't um, hear her so, at all. Okay. One second, one second. Sorry, sorry. One second, please. We'll try again. Um, can you start your question again? And uh, maybe just speak a bit louder. Okay. Can you hear me now? Is that good, Char? Almost. Yeah. Let's try it. Okay. Let's try. Okay. Um, hi. My name is Ellie. Uh, I've been a professional dog trainer for about 10 years now. And I've got a client that I am just not sure what to do with. So, um, okay, did you catch that? Oh, a difficult client question. Okay, let's try it. Okay. Um, so, her name Coco. She's a four year old mini Schnauzer mix. And she has some of the strongest female dominance issues I have ever seen. Uh, and so she's really good around other male dogs, totally fine. The second she's even eyesight with another female, she is barking, growling, going up a storm. And she never actually tries to, like, attack, but she goes for that back of the neck grab and pin and won't settle down. Oof. Any any mm. tips there, Char? I would not know what to do. I would be like, help. <laughs> You know, um, Ellie, you know, as a professional dog trainer, there's so many uh, other questions that need to be answered for this. But um, so you've got a four year old mini schnauzer, a female who just thinks she rules every other female. Is this dog intact? Was there anything that had a specific dog in her life? Um, as all medical condition, uh, medical uh, issues been ruled out. Yeah, so that's the interesting thing. She did not have this problem until she, she got a pyometra, an infected uterus, and she had to be spayed. This only started after her spay. Do you think this, do this is a med turning to medical, though, I'm wondering because the surgery was the turning point to a uh, new behavior, um, to talk to your vet, this might be one of those cases where this dog needs extra estrogen. So if she's going into a flight or fight mode, um, her hormones and adrenaline are taking in her maternal instincts and, and maybe, I don't know, more medical than to get addressed before we start addressing behavior. But what before that gets addressed, some other things are uh, some operant conditioning and counter kits again, where doesn't matter if the incoming dog or oncoming dog is male or female, big or small, curly or flat. She has to understand what her job is. So this little mini schnauzer needs to understand she can look at that and then she either needs to look at or walk away. Okay. So your timing on the wanted behavior, she's allowed to look, look at that and then look at me. So this is where you're either going to need a squeaky toy um, uh, maybe a really smelly piece of, I'm still looking at these darn cod skin cubes, <laughs> something really aromatic that will draw her attention and per perhaps light pressure on a harness to guide her away from the hot spot to get her back threshold. 
there's a lot going on here for this four-year-old dog. Um, but just, if you know, a quick fix would be to train her. You're allowed to look, but you're not allowed to, you know, try to rinse off. So the alternate behavior is look at me and let's walk away. Okay. And yeah. reinforce that walk away. And then the goal is, that she's allowed to look at that for one second, look at me, get a reward. Look at that for two seconds, look at me, get a reward. And your job is to keep the dog under threshold, active, to get that reward from you and to tell her she's a good girl. She doesn't have to feel like she needs to fight. Okay, excellent. We've been. Does that help? Yes, we've been doing that. The progress was just a little slower and I never thought to look on the medical side. So I will definitely pass that along and start that road. I definitely would just because of the key information that you said, the behavior changed after the surgery. Um, something might be missing there. Hmm. Excellent. Thank you very All right, thanks much. Thanks for your Thanks for your question. That's uh, I hope that hope there's some resolution there, some improvement. Uh -huh. Okay, so we 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 told Char she would be with us for about an hour. Char, do you have time for one more question? One more. One more. Okay, <laughs> Susan, uh, go ahead. You just have to unmute yourself, Susan. Oh, she's now she's gone. <laughs> she's now a listener. Um, Deedle Da, Deedle Da, you've got the last question. Deedle Da. Deedle Da. Just have to unmute yourself. Deedle Da. Hi, my name's Deidre, and uh, I'm, I'm the last question. I'm very honored. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Okay, quick question then. Um, so I have a, a two-year-old golden doodle. He's about 50 pounds, and I got him when I had an older dog who was very competent and very well trained. I got him as a rescue. I don't first five or six months was like. He was always um, apprehensive, but overall very well behaved. I think he took his cues from the older dog. She has now passed, and um, I do have a, a new puppy. And I just am looking for some tips to help him gain confidence so that he can, you know, fulfill his role now as the leader. I'm the leader, leader. I know that. But. Mm, so did you know that um yes so there's a difference obviously from being a, a leader and that old-fashioned uh training called alpha dominance and that's definitely been something that was uh debunked a long time ago so you're you're the benevolent leader of your family and of your of your doggy pack let's call it and um, you're the provider of all life sources and of all great things. <laughs> okay. But it's not your job to tell the dogs who's the leader dogs. Mm. They they will sort that out. Okay. Okay. He he just seems more you know, apprehensive. Some old fashioned training, just to kind of you know bring a light to some old fashioned training is I want my two year old doodle to know that. He's the boss and that we love him just as much, even though we brought in this new brat, this little puppy. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm going to let him eat first. I'm going to let him, you know, choose his own bed first. Um, and that's really, that will really skew things. And you, you could be setting yourself up for something that's called alliance aggression, hmm. where let's say you got it wrong. Let's say that, the, do the dog doesn't care who's leader or who's not in the dog pack. Um, and then you're trying to make the one, the leader who 